Much of Earth's geological history has been revealed with astonishing accuracy by amateurs who applied basic principles of observation to the landscape around them. Clues to Earth's history are visible everywhere. From the south rim of the Grand Canyon in northern Arizona, more than half the Earth's timeline is visible in the rock layers below. At the very bottom, the Colorado River is cutting a channel into primordial rock that formed more than two billion years ago. You are looking at Earth in its adolescence. Higher up, above the ancient stone basement, layer upon layer of newer geological formations, some created by volcanic flows of molten rock from deep within the Earth, others by sediment piled up at the bottom of ancient seas that advanced and retreated time and again. The topmost layers, primarily sandstone and limestone, contain fossils of early plant and animal life. From its basement to its rim, Grand Canyon is a chronological record of geological and biological progress encased in stone. While Grand Canyon may be the best known record of Earth's geological history, it is not the only one. In fact, scientists and amateurs alike often uncover extraordinary geological and biological artifacts in their own backyards. Well over a century ago, one famous amateur, and no stranger to the geological treasures of Grand Canyon, stumbled upon ancient fossils in his own backyard here in upstate New York. Samuel Clemens, better known as the American humorist Mark Twain, collected enough fossils to fill a small museum at Quarry Farm near the city of Elmira in New York's southern tier. Mark Twain's quarry continues to yield fossils from a time when Earth's biology was much less complex than today. Students from nearby Elmira College come by to search for fossils among the same siltstone and sandstone layers of sedimentary rock poured over by Clement. Originally there was a, a shallow sea here and this is a, a piece of wood that actually fell into it and was covered. What you can see here is you can see a little bit of carbon left from the wood and there's some other little sticks in here as well. This is probably a clam, and you can see the layers of how it grew over time. Each year is a different layer, and you can also tell by how thick the layers are, if the environment was really good and for it to grow well or not. I got one split in half, and then there's a bunch of bracket pods in there. Great. Oh, wonderful. What is the oh, These rocks are part of an ancient outwash of sedimentary material called the Catskill Delta, remains of an inland sea that once covered much of the region west of modern-day New England. Over time, this formation too will disappear. The sandstone will wash away, flattening the landscape until some future era of mountain building pushes subterranean rock upward, or until a re-advance of the sea throws yet another blanket of fossil-filled sandstone over the region. Or until the glaciers return, as they surely will, to impose their own geological footprint once again. The famous American naturalist John Muir wrote, Penetrate the wilderness where you may. The main telling features are quickly perceived. Eloquent monuments to the ancient ice rivers that brought them into relief. Mountain building and the accumulation of sedimentary deposits account for much of Earth's land mass. Erosion accounts for its appearance. It's an old, old story. But the latest chapter, the one about the most powerful erosive force in nature, the continent-spanning ice sheet, is still being written. In fact, all of human history, recorded in man's own hand, has occurred during the geologically insignificant period since the last great North American ice sheet melted. Put another way, the ice moved out of New York State about 90 centuries ago. The march of human civilization has been going on for half that long, about 46 centuries. 
Earth's geological history, on the other hand, spans about 46 million centuries. Prehistoric humans probably lived through another earlier ice age. There's plenty of evidence that ice sheets, miles thick in some places, have come and gone many times across Earth's high latitudes. And because of slight shifts in the way the Earth faces the sun, shifts that recur every 100,000 years or so, it is inevitable that future generations of plants and animals will have to adapt to the next ice age already on its way. Scientists say the most recent post-glacial period, the one in which we now live, will come to an end sometime during the next several thousand years, to be followed by yet another return of all-encompassing, mountain-crushing ice. How much ice? Viewed from the summit of Whiteface Mountain among the high peaks of the Adirondacks, Mount Marcy, the highest point in New York State, is just visible on the horizon 30 miles to the east. At 5,400 feet above sea level, Mount Marcy's summit towers above all the peaks visible here. Now imagine ice stretching upward to the height of two Mount Marcy's, one atop the other, covering this scene completely, a colossal mass of frozen water that remained in place for 100,000 years. Ice ages change everything. So much of Earth's water is captured and held in glaciers that sea levels plummet. Land bridges between continents emerge from the sea as the water level is drawn down. Arid deserts appear where dense forests once stood. New valleys are carved by the grinding action of glaciers in motion. Massive deposits of glacial till, stone and soil carried along by the ice, reconfigure lakes and rivers and streams. The current geography, geology, and ecology of most of upstate New York and all of Ontario, Quebec, and the Canadian Maritimes to the north result from changes brought on by the last great ice sheet, the Laurentide, as it retreated northward about 9,000 years ago.